Hi, my name is Tony D'Amato. I'm a professor of silviculture at the University of Minnesota, and I've been asked to respond to a posting on the discussion board dealing with uh, the Darwald concept and how it might apply to Minnesota's forests. I'm not specifically going to talk about the Darwald concept, but I'm going to talk about really an approach to forestry that's been um, advocated over the past 20 years or so called ecological forestry. And a lot of those principles do draw upon some of the same principles that were outlined in the early 20th century dealing with the Darwald in Germany. Ecological forestry really started to become uh, popular and advocated in the mid-80s to late 80s, uh, largely out of the Pacific Northwest. And one of the main concerns was that a lot of our other approaches to forestry, like multiple-use sustained yield and product production forestry, really were not giving much uh, attention to conserving biodiversity while we were also extracting wood products from the forest. And, and just like many other approaches that are valid in the landscape, like you know, production forestry for just sustained yield of timber, ecological forestry really has become a prominent uh, type of management that's occurring on a lot of our lands, particularly many of our public lands. For many woodland owners that might not be interested in doing more production-oriented forestry, ecological forestry might serve as a way for them to still harvest wood off their land but also achieve some of their goals like wildlife conservation or maintaining aesthetics on their property. Today I'm going to deal with two major principles that fall under the umbrella of ecological forestry. One of those principles is natural disturbance-based silviculture and the other one of those principles is managing for late successional structure. In terms of natural disturbance-based silviculture, as the name implies, really what we're trying to do with this approach is trying to emulate what we see in terms of the patterns, the scale, the frequency, the severity of disturbances in the landscape, and trying to pattern our harvesting treatments and entries after what we see following a windstorm or after what we see um, following a fire or other types of disturbances in the landscape. And so unlike a lot of our harvesting is traditionally done just to basically meet operational constraints, really what we're trying to do is emulate what might be the size of a gap that follows a windstorm? So can we create a harvest opening that emulates that gap? Or how big an area was typically disturbed by a fire in northern Minnesota? So can we do clear cuts or other types of management approaches that emulate both the size of those fires as well as how often they occurred? So a key component of natural disturbance-based silviculture is really understanding where you are in the landscape and what forest types you're in. Once you figure that out, then you can say to yourself, okay, what do we know in terms of natural disturbances that used to affect this forest type, and how can I best pattern some sort of management regime after that? One useful tool to, to determine what really has been the natural scale and pattern of disturbance in your woodlot is to use what the Native Plant Community Guides that the Department of Natural Resources put out. Within those guides, there are sections that talk about what was the history of these forests, you know, how often did surface fires burn through these areas, or how often did wind, wind storms occur. With an information, you can really think about if a fire came every 30 years, maybe it makes sense for me to do some sort of management regime that, that emulates that, that disturbance. The whole goal of emulating this disturbance regime is that we assume that most of the biodiversity that we have here in Minnesota, that is our native biodiversity, evolved in response to the disturbances that were creating different forest conditions across the landscape. And so when a certain windstorm frequency occurred, it created a certain amount of that landscape in early successional habitat. Another portion of that landscape might have had a lot of down wood on it. And so many of our birds and other animals have responded to that disturbance over the past millennia. And so what we're trying to do with this management approach is try to emulate those patterns to, to restore as much or maintain as much biodiversity as we can in the landscape. One important caveat to natural disturbance-based silviculture is that we're using a lot of information from the past to try to manage in the present. And, and right now we have a lot of emerging threats like invasive species or global climate change that weren't around when we were when we were looking at disturbances in the past. So it's important to really take an approach that even though we're managing for past conditions, we're also including and adapting to any new emerging threats that are coming out in the landscape and maintaining as much resiliency in those forests um, to these future emerging threats that, that we can. One important thing to keep in mind when we're trying to emulate natural disturbances is that we're not only trying to emulate the intensity, the severity, and the scale of those disturbances, we're also trying to emulate what would be left behind following those disturbances. So what we often call biological legacies. These are the trees that maybe survive the disturbance, so living trees, or, or the wood that's on the ground after that disturbance, so down logs or, or standing dead trees. And so when you're implementing natural disturbance-based management in your landscape, think about how can I incorporate some of these legacy elements into my harvest? Can I leave behind a couple of logs in the ground to emulate what might be on the ground there following a windstorm? Can I leave behind a couple of living trees within an area that naturally probably would have burned, but a few trees could have survived? So trying to incorporate those legacies into this natural disturbance-based approach really provides more of a holistic condition after that forest disturbance that would be more realistic relative to what we know in the past. Importantly, 
there's obviously trade-offs in terms of how much you leave behind. You know, those are materials that you could easily harvest off your land and sell in market and get, get money in your pocket from. And so there's a real trade-off in terms of how much you want to leave behind in the landscape versus how much you want to make off your land. Along the same token, in terms of the emulation of natural disturbance, if you're trying to emulate a very fine scale disturbance intensity and severity out there where basically you're just doing small gaps throughout your land, in order for a logger to, to operate out there and in order to sell that wood, you're really going to need to have a large area of small harvest to make it worth their while. And so think a lot about not only what you're ecologically trying to accomplish, but also what are some of the economic and operational constraints of these, these management principles. And that's really where working with the consulting forester to develop a good stewardship plan that really outlines what your expectations are, what you're trying to accomplish, as well as um, puts in some um, language that it specifies to those loggers and operators what exactly you're trying to accomplish out there in the landscape. So to just to reiterate one more time in regards to natural disturbance-based management, not all of us have at our disposal a vast knowledge of what really happened on your land in the past in terms of natural disturbances or, or what is appropriate for the forest type you're in. So again, those native plant community guides by the DNR are an excellent resource and, and on My Minnesota Woods they have links to those guides where you can find out where you can purchase them or you can talk to your consulting forester about those guides. And basically what you should do is you know, look at what community you're in, try to understand what the natural disturbances are and, and then talk to your consulting forester. How might I build this into what I want to do for my woodlot? How might it meet my economic, my ecological and, and aesthetic goals out of my landscape? And then go from there working forward and trying to find a way to come up with a good plan for your property that can, can fit within this, this realm of ecological forestry.